Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric. And I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. We're talking to people about their work and what's happening in the field with the hopes of making this growing arena just a little bit more accessible to us all. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. And you can email us at hello at Let's Hear It Cast dot com. Let us know if you have any thoughts about what you hear today, including people we should have on the show. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we're back. It's another edition of Let's Hear It. We're so glad to have you. Once again, we're here, but most importantly, you're here. And very importantly, my friend, my colleague, my dear confidant, Mr. Eric Brown, you're here. And once again, you've done it again. I'm so glad you're here. How are things? What's going on? <laughs> Tell me everything. What's oh, Kirk. <laughs> you really need to improve your mood. Oh, come on. You're this just is, so down. You're such an Eeyore. Why time, why why so blue, Mr. It's Brown? It's time to embrace the sunshine. It's summertime. You, you have know? sunshine because you're up in Marin County. <laughs> Those of us in San Francisco are are covered in moss because yeah, we right. haven't seen the sun in, in weeks and weeks. We have nothing to complain about, given that not that far north from us, it's been 110 degrees and hotter. I swear to you, I, at a time. I found a frog in my underwear this morning. Oh, no. It is cold and damp yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. If only if only we had some rain, though. If only we had some rain. I rocked. I walked around a little uh, one of our lakes in Marin County here today, and there's nothing in it. There's literally no water no in water. it. Oh. No, and it's like it's literally these are the end times. These are the end times, Mr. Brown. So let's smile. Get, let's see. Get all let's your Marin friends happy. to spit in the lake and then yeah, finally have right. some moisture. That's exactly in it. Right. Well, here we are. That, now that we've gotten that out of the way. We're here, and I'm so glad we're doing a podcast about social change communications because we get to listen to the best conversations. And you've got to set this up, Mr. Brown, because this is fantastic. I can't wait for the intro. I can't wait to uh, listen to the interview and then come back because once again, you've done it. You've done it again, Mr. Brown. There's a lot to talk about here. I'm not guilty. <laughs> we are here. I had a great conversation with Precious Stroud who is the founder of the Black Female Project, and she runs PJS Consultants. And we have had many, many conversations, as you know, about asset framing. We have spoken with Travian Shorters, and we have continued to talk about how do we create narratives that help us all understand who we all are on the planet. That's all. And I... Precious is one of those people who is embodying that through her work, the work that she does, the Black Female Project, and all these other things. And when when Valerie Good, who's the um, who's the vice president for marketing communications at the San Francisco Foundation, who is a guest on this show and is a, a pal of mine, when we spoke, she said, "Oh, you have to talk to Precious because she's living the work." And and so mm -hmm. I was really excited about that, and that's what this conversation is about. So this is Precious Stroud from, among other things, the Black Female Project and PG, PGS Consultants. You can find Precious at PreciousStroud.com. Very important to put that out there because I'm sure you're going to want to look up her and her work if you're not familiar with it. Um, let's go in and listen and uh, let's come back and talk about it. This is Precious Stroud on Let's Hear It. Welcome to Let's Hear It. Folks, sit down Get ready. You are in for a treat. My guest today is Precious Stroud. She is the co-founder of the Black Female Project. She is the head of PJS Consultants, and she is an extraordinary, you are, Precious, an extraordinary person, and I'm really, really, really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for coming on to Let's Hear It. Thank you, Eric. How you been? I'm doing great. The sun is out. Summertime. I am good and can't be anything but thankful at this point. I should, I should say, so we were introduced by a mutual friend, and uh, for me anyway, someone I really respect and look up to, uh, Valerie Good, who's the head of communications at the San Francisco Foundation. And mm -hmm. I'm excited to talk to you about this, about what you're doing, because 
uh, I continue to look to people who can teach me or from whom I can learn. If I'm lucky enough, they also choose to teach me. But you've been working around in, in the area of narrative change and particularly on ad advancing our understanding of equity and justice. And I, I would just, I'm so happy to be able to have the chance to get into what it is you do and how you do it and what you've learned and who you've learned from. So let, if we could start off, how, how did you get into this work in the first place? Sure, Eric, and also I'm um, appreciating Valerie for the introduction, who I came to know through my work at Oakland Unified School District. And the way I came to this, you know, I was thinking about that as we were talking about having this conversation. And when I look back, it really has been most of my career. So I guess the short of it is I made a transition from working in technology public relations graduating from and you know going right into career the dark side no not the dark side the, was it the dark side um it was not a pay, if you ask anybody who got paid at that time <laughs> there was nothing dark about it but um you know then the layoff started yeah right and yeah. um it was right around that time the bottom fell out i ended up um, making a transition to communications and marketing and working with young people. And I really enjoyed it. I had no idea I had a knack for it. And so from then, as I began to continue working in and around colleges and universities, the idea of how the students were being portrayed became really important to me because it so reflected how they then saw themselves. Talk, talk about that. How, how were the students being portrayed? What, what, did it, what did that say to you? Well, you know, college campuses are quite a microcosm of the greater society. So um, if students are told constantly that they are students and not, in, in some cases, not necessarily considered grown-ups, fully capable of making adult decisions, they are adults. Um, that's, where they, that's where they make the transition from being a teenager into adulthood. So um, my students were student leaders. Primarily, I worked with student leaders who were working in associated students and or other um, student leadership roles. They were elected by their peers, and they held a different level of responsibility on campus. So there was a real grind for them. I suppose they taught me. You now, are you talking about teaching? <laughs> they taught me about how to respect them. And I worked for them. I was an employee of associated students. So... I just learned to respect them in a different way. And also it was reciprocal. They needed me for some of the professional things that need to happen for their organization. And likewise, I need to make sure that the organizations we partnered with were in service to them. I was very conscious when um, other partners on campus would refer to students in like a diminutive, a diminutive way. I think that's where the seed was planted. In addition to my history, just as a person in general, I can tell you all about that, my Berkeley hometown and all of the beautiful things that come with that. Um, but that's how I would say career-wise it started. It's kind of amazing to think that on a university campus or a college campus or even a community college campus, that the students aren't considered important in, in that way, that they aren't con considered to be so um, intrinsic to the work. I mean, what, it's kind of like it would be a great job if we're ever the clients, right? That, you know, <laughs> this is this is the purpose of, of education is to help inspire people to learn to be the best that they can be, to give back to society. They're the, the, the glue. Without the students, what do you got, right? Why do you think that happens? Well, how could people think that way? The bottom line is people, it is true that it is an institution of higher learning. And I haven't been on campus in a long time, so I'm sure all of them are phenomenal now. When I was <laughs> in higher ed, and it was a short tenure of maybe three to five years, in addition to all of the people who were there in service to young people, in service to students, in service of learning, there are some people who are just going to work. Mm -hmm. And young people or the students became a barrier to getting things done. We need to get done for the work. <laughs> right? right. Students have power. They don't always use their power because they don't know they have it, much like the rest of us in citizen in our citizenry. And so as a student advocate and a student services professional, it was my job to ensure 
that students' voices were heard, that they were responded to. And unfortunately at the time where I was, it was a unique, it was a unique position because that was a long time ago now. And I, I, I want to make sure that I'm respecting the fact that the institutions themselves are beautiful places for all of us to stretch. We all know college campuses are a beautiful place to work because there's this constant undertow of growth. Like you're expected to grow. You're expected to expand. And so um, what it meant for me was that I saw young people as whole versus something to be fixed, adjusted, refined. Like they were whole already. The other thing is they change so fast. Like if you, they ask for if input or feedback, a year later, they're a different person. That was so rewarding to me. And so I think um, what it meant to me was that everyone brings something to the table and everyone's voice should be heard. That sounds like a pretty good proving ground to continue to understand how to develop narratives, how to communicate, how to use language to respect or lift up people. H how did you take that experience forward? Oh my goodness. So <laughs> what happened for me was I then ended up in a, I think it was a for-profit institution where young people were being recruited from all of these specific places for this alternative education. But because I had been in a traditional school environment previously, I realized that many of my students, not all of them, but many of them actually might have thrived in a different environment academically. So then I started getting curious about college choice and where do students actually begin to get their foundation for how they'll decide what college to go to and or how they even get access to the options. That led me to exploring uh, K-12 opportunities. And that's how I ended up at a organization that became the public Oakland Public Education Fund. It was definitely a proving ground. The It was the Oakland Small Schools Foundation at the time, which became the Oakland Schools Foundation, which became the Public Education Fund. It was, again, a startup kind of environment. I say again because of the organization I was first out of college. It had just gone through its IPO. So similar in some ways, it was facile and able to adjust to what its clients or the people we were serving needed. In our case, it was students and families and um, school leaders. So I went from coaching students at the college level to now coaching principals. And again, um, um, Holly Babe Faust was my boss at the time. I, we had a fantastic team. I actually work with one of our colleagues today. She, she and I partner at my firm. And um, because the team was just so great. Holly was really clear about how we represent the young people and how we talk about the schools. Many of the schools we worked at didn't have traditional PTAs. And so in many ways, we served as the PTA for those schools in terms of the fundraising arm. So I'm just going to skip a little bit. Coaching students, coaching principals, then to coaching districts, and eventually saying along the way, always keeping clients. So I, my first job talking about transition from high school to college, my first year of college, I got a job with a woman who was running her business. She was an author and a speaker out of her home office, and I was her assistant. She had clients. My third year of school, I had another internship with a woman who was an author, speaker, and a trainer, and she had a home office. And so I thought, oh, well, I have to have clients. So they were my clients. <laughs> and so all the time I've been working at these companies, always had clients. And so finally, after coaching the districts and watching again, kind of these internal teams where you know how it is as a young comp professional, um, your bosses, our bosses would bring in firms who would write awesome plans. And they didn't necessarily have any idea about nonprofit work or what the capacity of our organizations were or what the needs were to get us from one step to the other. So I said, well, if I stop telling my clients, no, I might actually be able to do this full time and be able to provide the service that I think we really needed all this time with cultural appropriateness. We even had a firm tell us once, and you know, I was still maybe mid-level career and you know, you know how it goes when you're in a hierarchical organization, part of it is me learning to use my voice. <laughs> and part of it is the organization learning to understand that young professionals really should be listened to. So 
um, we had to ask this firm once, we said, you might want to reconsider some of these images. Are there any people of color on your team that can help? And they're like, we don't even know where to get people. Like, where would we go? And we were like, maybe leave your office and go in the elevator and down to the street and like talk to real people. Okay. Because these models that you have that are representing the students that you're saying you're representing across the state of California, there's no relatability. They're models. I won't get into the details because somebody out there, I'm sure, would know the campaign, but it was not well received by um, the field. And it was because there was a lack of sensitivity, a lack of awareness, and a disconnect between what the work we were really doing is and was and their vantage point. There was just a lack of connection. And then there, on top of that, there was the lack of respect for the voices of the people who were closest to the work. It's been a year or two, hasn't it? Uh, the last year or so, mm -hmm. we, a lot of things have happened. It's been a time. Yeah, I've learned a lot. I care deeply about this work. I wonder if you and your vantage point now look at this last year or two, and if you can say that we've gotten anywhere, if you think that we're making progress, if you think that that firm that would have come to you with not very many people of color and a bunch of models who aren't actually real students, if you think that's changing, if you think if you went back to that same place now, it would be any better. I'm jumping way ahead to the existential part of our conversation, but are we getting anywhere? So yes, we're getting somewhere, but that firm in particular, I would I would gather that the, the, the reckoning, even when I thought about my company at that time, the reckoning is, are you brave enough? to say, I really don't know. We could have been doing this work 12 years ago, talking about exactly some of these things. One might say it wasn't the time. No, no, no. It just took courage to be the first. So now no one has mm -hmm. to be the first. So people are entering. Also, I think for our field in particular around public service and or nonprofit or community-based work, the organizations understand that there is a need to do things differently. In addition to the fact that the major events shook people to their core in many cases and helped illuminate the amount of stories that we were seeing. So this kind of goes back and that, and that takes us to a beautiful point for me to mention um, the work of Travian Shorters, who I know is on your podcast and also who you know. Um, so I had been yeah. following and was kind of a super fan for a long time because I had been Hearing and um, studying asset-based framing in the when I was looking and doing work in the field of Black male achievement, and my work with, at the African American Male Achievement Department with Oakland Unified was really important in my development. And also, I was able to make some really, I was able to try things, learn things, and learn about the movement in a way that helped me start to uncover some resources. So when we started, I started looking more and more into asset base, which of course led me to asset framing and back to the stories, which I'm getting back to stories. So the multiplicity of stories that are out now are giving us the opportunity to fill the story bank with new information. If all that we're doing is drawing from this kind of memory bank, then the more stories, the more images we have. Now, if we were looking at the Oakland Schools Foundation at the time I was there, we were very conscientious about what images we chose. We were very conscientious. And part of this was because it's us, like we're reflected. When there's a disconnect, that care for the reflection didn't come through. And I think now we have a different consciousness about the importance of that and a different understanding about um, what it takes to learn how to truly uncover, discover oneself, because anything that we produce is coming from self. And that sense of responsibility is different than it was before. It's not in service to me. It's not in service to your young people. It's in service to your best and highest wholeness. I think that's different than it was before. And I could share more, maybe we'll do that later about some of the in interesting things we've been doing. But I do also want to say it was important to me also, I. We had a, um, a photographer at the time we would work with and the way that he worked, just you saw the humanity of the children. And I've worked with many photographers since then and I still don't get that exceptional love for the children that comes out in the, even the images. So and I, I know there's amazing talent out there and I know I'm seeing beautiful things all the time, but I'm just saying like in my personal experience, there was something special about him because of the deep love he had for the children he was working with. 
Well, I know that you have taken that and created a, a story project that I want to know a lot more about. After the break, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about, about that work and more. Um, we'll be right back with Precious Stroud. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Kirk Brown and Eric Brown. Let's Hear It is sponsored by the Communications Network, which connects, gathers, and informs the field of leaders working in communications for good. Because foundations and nonprofits that communicate well are stronger, smarter, and vastly more effective. You can find Let's Hear It online at letshearitcast.com or on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. Thanks for listening. And now back to the show. And we are back with Precious Stroud. She's the the founder of the Black Female Project, and she runs PJS Consultants. So we're getting into this story bank, beginning to help people understand how to reference people by their assets, the things that they bring, their hopes and dreams, the the great experiences, the things we can all learn from from folks rather than defining people by what they don't have, and which is the, it's kind of the basis of, of asset framing. So you started the Black Female Project and I'd love to know how you got that idea and what you did about it. You started a whole bunch of other things. You are a starter of things, which I also really admire. Can you talk about the Black Female Project? Sure, I can. I would love to. Um, the Black Female Project, in some ways, is a demonstration project of an asset-based or asset-framed approach to storytelling. And the reason it exists is because it's a reflection of my own healing journey. So... I got to a point in my career where I was looking for answers. If I thought I was prepared, then why did I feel like it just wasn't working well? Navigating the elements of racism, navigating the elements of sexism within the context of an organization was difficult. And I was not well prepared. I was well prepared for some of it, but some of it you just have to live through and have the experience. But no one told me that one strategy was to make me question myself, therefore I would be insecure and not able to deliver. Then you could, one could say, well, you're not delivering. Well, that's because I'm completely isolated and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So these strategies we know, they play out in lots of different ways. When you apply race and gender, it becomes a, a specific form of um, disempowerment and also can be deafening if you don't know what's going on. So I had an experience um, where I kind of just started seeing clearer and I was like, holy moly, this has nothing to do with me. This is, this is just this way it's been and the status quo way. And I could actually choose to either live above it, step away from it. Um, and I'm going to write my story because this is difficult. And then I thought, well, if it's going to be my story and I think I'm going to help people, we'll need more stories than mine because different young people will respond to different things. And I also wanted something where people could read something like we, we, we were talk about systemic racism or systemic sexism, but there was no example. There was no definition for a play-by-play -play at work. So we started writing those experiences down and Black Female Project really focuses on elevating the stories of Black women, affirming those stories and the women for their own healing purpose, and then sharing those stories so that others can either be better prepared for what they're gonna face or understand the people around them. So that's what Black Female Project is and it is growing and became a nonprofit three years ago and will release its first industry specific story collection called Teacher Truth, which is a focus on black educators in the state of California um, this fall. Is there a, a story that really spoke to you? I'm sure there are tons of them, but are there one that that kind of really got you, that helps you understand that this is what you should be doing? Oh, this is what I should be doing. You know what? I think one of the things that's really beautiful about this is I think it's the benefit of hearing what women have reflected back more than something that I, I read. And I think those things that we hear like, um, I read your story and I quit my job. Right. <laughs> because I realized that I could see then what was happening and what was in store for me. And I knew I wanted more. Or I read the stories and I realized I've been putting up with so much for so long that me and my family decided I could step away for a while and take care of myself. 
And then we have the ones who are like, oh, now I get it. Cause they've been in a community where they've been affirmed and they're like, wait a minute, you mean it's not me? Oh, I mean, going after it, CFO track, um, promoted, moved on. Like almost everyone has from the initial cohort has um, taken leaps and bounds in their career and will cite black female project as a turning point for them or herself. So that's been really beautiful to watch. I know you want a story. I'll, I'll give it a little more thought. Um, there, there are plenty and I, I kind of want to keep it like super positive, but the one that always comes to mind for me is one around a woman who was doing some technical work and backing out of installing some stuff and just a really crude statement made by a coworker and her being disciplined and him not, right? Like as the, if the mm. woman then is the one who perpetuated who then it was um, affirmed to her like, um, well, maybe, you you know, maybe what did you do to him? You know, that kind of thing. It was just, that kind of stuff is just, we know it, some of us experience it, some of us observe it, but really it, it's too common. It's just too, it's too often acceptable. Certainly these stories were before the Me Too movement, but I am sure we wouldn't have to ask too many people before we'd hear a very present, experience in the, even in the last few months. I dare say that in the time that you took to tell that story, it happened out there just just this moment. I mean, we, we know how far we have to go. It's funny, as you said this, I, I felt the need to, I don't know if it's confess or ask forgiveness to uh, a, someone that you interviewed for this project, Gail Fuller, mm -hmm. who is an old uh, colleague and friend of mine, and we were in an office, and I, I just remember saying something that was to my mind, so um, <laughs> so male, and <laughs> and and probably uh, so white male, where she had done something as as the communication director, and I said, "Well, you should have just done this or something, something." So, and and if Gail is listening, I know she listens to the podcast sometimes. I just I I, I apologize. I I think back at that moment a, a number of times, and you she handled it with such grace. I didn't intend to do her harm, but I'm sure that she felt as though I had judged her f from a position of absolute no consciousness and no experience. And I think that probably happens a lot. I've done it. I've, you see it from day to day. But I also think that the work that you're doing to illuminate these stories helps people see what happens and helps people take stock of how we treat each other, how we work together, but also how as communicators, mm -hmm. the narratives that we are advancing. So I like to think myself as semi, semi enlightened and I still mess up a lot and I acknowledge that. And I don't know, I just wanted to put that out there, but one of the reasons that your work is so exciting to me is because I think it is helpful to all, to everybody. Uh, you certainly don't have to be a black female to benefit from the Black Female Project. You would be lucky to be exposed to the Black Female Project. But I think, you know, we had a um, one of our early transcribers, he said, he just kept going over and over again, just thank you so much. He was a, a young in his career and he was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because until someone says it out loud, is it real, is it me? And then the other thing I would acknowledge is that we all are looking in this mirror all the time, right? Like we're assessing and refining. And I think that that part that really grinds, I think people, especially women of color, is that I, I don't have the choice, mate. Okay, that's not true. We always have a choice and we always have power. Like, let's be clear. That assessment, that self-assessment that I think a lot of us do, when people just don't, it creates situations. Let me just give you an example instead of me trying to talk about it. So a recent podcast episode was with Tanya Holland, um, chef and restaurateur who, um, has a restaurant here in Oakland, um, Brown Sugar Kitchen. In the conversation, so here I am, I have started this business and I've curated who I work with and why I work and how we work. And she said to your example, like what you, the example you mentioned about Gail, that people in her own, in her kitchen would question her. Like this is her business, she, it's her vision, it's everything. And she's like, I'm like, for real? Like I have to deal, I had to deal with that all this time and now I have to deal with it in the business I built just because you you embody what our society is, that you can't see beyond all the training and all of this. So when we get to communications, right? Like we're these are stories that we perpetuate. 
not because we're being necessarily strategic about the doing it, but because we never thought to shake it up or we didn't know there was a different choice or that we can step away from the status quo and say, wait a minute, like what is the assessment I need to make on this writing, on this image, on the combination of this headline with this image that could shift to focusing on the wholeness of that person and maybe some of the barriers or challenges that still exist. I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important point. And it, it's almost as though until we get it in our, you know, in our fat cells, until it, it embodies us, we almost need to make a checklist in which we ask, our, ask and answer these questions fairly about whether we are truly understanding and representing a truth and just make sure that we challenge ourselves. Is this, is, is this accurate? Is it fair? Is it, is, it, is it real? Is it engaging? And is it true? You know, it takes more time. Too bad. Because until, until it emanates through us, we have to check ourselves. Because our unconscious, our implicit, or all the other kind of biases that we bring to us are far more powerful, and Trabian has taught us more than th that as well as anybody, than anything intellectual, anything our brainy brain. Will, will teach us. That's, that's what I've taken away from, from that work is that I really, really don't know much mm -hmm. and that I have to keep, and I, my experience is different mm -hmm. and that I have to keep checking on that. I, I was talking to Travian about how I saw a chipmunk and, and the, the, chip, the difference between a chipmunk and a rat is a little white stripe on the back and we hate the rat and we love the chipmunk. And what has happened is that we have some characters in our society have a little white stripe on their back and some of them don't. And they're both inherently the same being in nature. And that's, that was the big lesson for me. And this work that you do is a really great example of how do you, somebody says, well, how do I get myself, how, how do I understand how to respond in a way that's, that's legitimate or, or, or authentic? The answer is you surround yourself with these stories. Mm -hmm. you, you get them in there mm -hmm. and you meet people like you, Precious. Mm -hmm. What do you see the future? Yeah. Where do you, when you look down the road, what, what do you see? I think we are gonna see a lot more organizations with more refined communications. I think we will see more thoughtfulness. I think, I mean, ultimately I love to see more people of color hired in the positions. I mean, part of our work right now is mm -hmm. there's, okay, can you read for cultural sensitivity? Can you read for um, appropriateness? Can you, and we're happy to do that and to work with teams to help like um, get some of those muscles going about thinking about things outside of whatever their norm lens is. But ultimately we would hope not that it would be the responsibility of that person, but that a more, a more enriched team would certainly be able to talk about the experiences of that um, or of that population that we're either discussing or serving. So when we have, um, you know, an Asian Pacific Islander project, like we're definitely going to call people with lived experience in that if they're not already on our team for that project, because there are things that would be picked up that we would just never know. There are nuances. There are things we can look for and things we've been trained to do, certainly. But nothing takes the place of the, the intuition and the lived way that people respond. I remember one of the women in our network who um, has a, a podcast coming out. She is an ER doctor and they talk about how you have to have diversity at that intake team because people may not even think to tell you, oh, I ate this thing because they're just like, I ate. But it's that one, somebody who knows could say, hey, have you had, it sounds like you had this dish. Doesn't it have this in it? Right? Like those are the kinds of that's the kind of intimacy we need when we're telling other people's stories. It's a privilege to do so. So that's the other piece. Like uh, nobody owes anyone anything because you're giving them something like this is about we share this world. We share. We're willing to share our experiences. And the least we could do for one another is to represent people in their wholeness. So I think, it, I think we're, well, we're moving forward. I'm glad. I'm glad you think that. I I like to think that, but I'm an optimist, which always gets me into trouble. But and and yet, I mean, I'm I'm very excited by the people I get the opportunity to work with, and the work that I get to see, and I'm learning a lot. And but it, and I'm, it, it's I, I feel like we're getting somewhere, but I, what do I know? 
but I and I and I really love what you're doing and I was so excited to have a chance to speak with you I um thanks so much for coming on and I'm looking forward to see what what new thing you start next because like I said you actually we didn't even get into love action reaction maybe we can do that next time uh, a, another project of yours but thank you so much precious precious stroud um, of the black female project and pjs consultants thanks again for coming on thank you eric and we are back no we're not so oh no we are back. <laughs> of the many so many easy. things of the many things to talk about this I love this sentence from Precious and her website. I envision a world where marketing images and messages uplift with dignity. That is such a beautiful expression of what this work can be about. And Eric, talk to me about the journey that brought you to Precious because Oh my gosh, what a vital voice. And you know, it's interesting. I think about this is our third season with Let's Hear It. <laughs> That's about Amazing. the time frame that Black Female Project has been operating, right? So what a cool chance to hear where it's come, what it's doing, and obviously talk about the background Precious brings to it. But yeah, talk to me about the journey that that, that brought you to Precious because this is such a welcome voice to all of these many welcome voices we've had on this podcast. Well, there's two ways to talk about the journey. As I talked about in the intro, Valerie Good recommended Precious to me because she's doing the kind of work that we've been talking about on the show for three years, which is how yeah. do we how do we use communications to create a better world? And in that time, <laughs> three years ago is a long time in uh, the modern <laughs> era, Mr. Brown. This is pre-COVID. It's pre-black. It, it, it's 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 before George Floyd. It's be before the the reckoning, if you want to call it that. Yes. But and and yep. needless to say, there has been a reckoning. Has needed to be a reckoning for a long period of time. But it feels to me that for many people, that that moment has crystallized in this last year. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea that Precious started this work three years ago, in which she is bringing together the voices of of black females, black women, to to talk about their work, their challenges and their opportunities and 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 to help us all to better understand the totality of of the, the world we live in is is really important. And as as I, I said to her, you know, I I certainly hope that you you don't have to be a black female to to benefit from the black female project and I think that that's what we have been talking about over the last, whatever, a couple of years in which we have said we, we have to better understand how to create narratives that advance the, the way we want to see the world and, and create, almost even change our brain chemistry so that we look at people in the way that, through their aspirations, through the things that people want to achieve, rather than defining people by their what, what's missing. And she's a living embodiment of that. She's extraordinary and really fun to talk to. And and that that so that was that's how that conversation came about. It felt to felt to me like oh wow these are every single thing we ever talked about coming together in one person. Well, and you know I was thinking while you were having the discussion, it was so inspiring. And once again, the master's class sensibility that precious by embodying embodying the work and being so sincere in how to approach it welcomes you into the journey and actually puts you on it just as you're, as she's describing the work and how she's doing it. And of course, when she said that she's a Traby and Shorter super fan, of course, I jumped up in my chair and, you know, and saluted. Let's just and, hope you weren't driving. Well, yeah, no, I was that safely, would have been a problem. It's God's taking careful oh, notes. Oh, good. But what, what a beautiful testament of outcome. I think about Traby and all, all of his work and that great sensibility around asset framing that he's introduced to all of us. And then to see somebody like Precious pick that up and say, Hey, let's do this this way. It really, it's, it's so interesting. It's almost like a fresh start. It's almost like a reboot, if you will, to this core sensibility about what communications and purpose and narrative the offer can make and how it can be transformative. Doesn't it feel that way to you? Like there's, a, I, I, I felt, I felt like I'm ready to start again. Basically, 
hearing Precious talk about the work. Does that does that land for you, or, or how does that? Well, what do you make of that? It doesn't, as you say, that it remind as you say this. It reminds me that it is all of our jobs to collect these stories, the yes. stories of people and what they are hoping to achieve. Uh, frankly, sometimes the challenges and how you overcome them or how you address them. Uh, she talked about the um, the chef at the Brown Sugar Kitchen in Oakland. <laughs> de- de- and this is her kitchen, her restaurant, dealing with folks who basically do not understand the the experience of of, of the owner and chef of this place, and and how even in that instance she is trying to address these challenges and and dealing with them in I would say productive ways. We all need to start or to continue to collect these stories. And I don't want to become a storytelling, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, uh, get too fixated on it. But these are the ways that when we talk about what what we all want to achieve, that it builds in each of us an understanding of what the future could be, rather than thinking about the challenges and the problems and seeing, and I, again, I trotted out my old chipmunk versus the rat you know yeah a chipmunk <laughs> is a rat with a stripe on its back and we look at it and we think about it differently and and yeah. that's how we see so much of our world when we look outside the window or we look at television is it is a chipmunk is it a rat and in fact they're all basically the same thing and mm. and we're failing to see that and by capturing those stories and sharing them repeating them and you know, lather, rinse, repeat. That's how you build a better future in which people understand that we're all in this stuff together. Well, and you start from the premise that the stories are worth capturing in the first place. And there was such an interesting thing about the notion of story banking that turned an old concept on its head for me, at least. You know, because you know, so much of our communications work. You could almost see it through the lens, or at least part of it, you can see through the lens of like media relations. And there's this hunger, this thirst to, it's not, it's what we can get placed, right? People always have that. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this and let's place this and, and we're going to, you know, try to get this outlet here or there, or, you know, we're, we're really push, we're trying to figure out how we push these, insert these ideas into this public narrative. And, and while I'm sure that that piece is covered in the Black Female Project as well, this other part of it, which is, you know, Precious is talking about just honoring the voices and seeing us we're in the reflection. And it's just important to do that first part, which is acknowledge these stories are out there that we can do the work to collect them and we can story bank them. So we can start populating our minds with this new framework. Again, that's the part that just feels like it's, it's like this fresh invitation to think about the work in a really fresh way. And, and, you know, and to see that tracking back to Drabian and, and then being situated in the context of this reckoning that we've been in. And again, Precious, nothing but gracious for how she's talking about that and bringing us into that, you know, her own journey around that. It's just, it, it really, it's just, it's so inspiring. It's, it's, it's like, I want to be part of this field, right? It's like, it's like this invitation. Let's, let's, let's all do this work together and let's, 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 let's participate in this. Um, I also love that idea of this, the idea of the reckoning. It's being brave enough to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And we keep coming back to that part of this, right? It's like, we want to say we're about learning. We want to say we're, we're about taking risk. We want to say about we're you know, trying out different strategies and we're going to be dispassionate and assessing how things go. But there's real bravery required in just acknowledging what we don't know. And, and again, it's it's the voices like Precious, that, that those people that are actually inviting us all into that conversation that I, that I actually feel like are happening are helping bring that bravery to the whole field. I mean, what do you think about that? Do you, do, do, does that land for you or what do you think about that? Gee, Kirk, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? How dare You're you? the setter and I'm the spiker on the volleyball team, <laughs> even though you are way taller than I am. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Uh, I mean, it is also true that when I'm always in, I'm I'm always flattered when people want to come on, and I'm always mm. so grateful that people are candid and they talk about their what they do and don't know, or they they talk about their journey in ways that are illuminating and 
it does it's not a sales pitch it's here's how here's where i started here's what i learned here's where i went here's where i am and here's where i'm going and i think that stuff is great and you were quite right that anyone who thinks they know anything about anything right now is full of it because yeah. nobody could have predicted that we'd be where we are and the mm-hmm. only thing that you can possibly do is have a, an approach to what you do have an understanding about why it matters have some energy about sharing what you've learned, what you know, what you don't know, and the grace to go forward with a happy heart. And I think that that absolutely sums up Precious Stroud, the work that she's doing, and the generosity with which she even engaged in this conversation with me, which was delightful, and I'm grateful. You know, so the one, as we, uh, I know we're at time, but the, the one reflection too, I have to say, when you started out and just kind of, of course, we love the origin stories, right? We love where people come from and, and precious starts in tech public relations. Right. <laughs> and I'm just thinking to myself, man, what a, what a journey, right? What, yeah. what, a, what a different place to be in terms of the work that she's doing now. But um, that grounding she had when, you know, she started that work in a college campus setting and reflecting on it as a microcosm of the greater society and this idea that students and how students were being portrayed and, you know, they're not being considered adults, not being considered fully capable of making decisions when in fact they are in her intuitive sense that she wanted to be respectful and she wanted to be of service. It's funny, you know, I go back and forth in my own mind about this notion of, of this whole capacity and how teachable it really is. And sometimes I think it's eminently teachable because that's the inherent work we're all in is to try to, you know, improve our work and learn and be learners and share. And at the same time, that impulse, that instinct to generosity and service and, you know, viewing students as, you know, as whole rather than needing to be fixed. And then having that be the jumping off point for this entire career I don't know. It just seems like there's that spark and it seems like people like precious really bring it And It's an incredible and maybe too often unnamed asset in the entire equation is that just intuitive empathy and desire to lift people up. I mean, and of course, you know, precious alluded to her own story of healing and all the work too. But I mean, what do you think about that? I, I go back and forth on this piece about, can we train and teach and coach Or do you have to bring a certain fundamental spark that makes it all come together? I don't know. I I keep going back and forth on that. (laughs) Well, that's a conversation for another day. But the one thing I will (laughs) say is that Precious clearly understood that her job wasn't to speak for these students. It was to give these Mm. students the opportunity to use their voice. And I think Mm. those are two completely different things. And that kind of intuition, can you teach it? I'm not sure. Can you ensure that you... Um, create a set of questions that at least encourage any communications professional to explore those those opportunities, I think probably you can. Well, Precious Stroud, thank you so much for joining us on Let's Hear It. I love how she describes her purpose in realizing her vision of a world where marketing images and messages uplift with dignity. dignity. She founded the Black Female Project and PGS Consultants to positively impact the wellness and professional experience of Black women and to provide marketing communication services to organizational leaders who want to hashtag do good, like for real, exclamation (laughs) point. And uh, man, Precious Stroud, I hope that you are busy beyond belief because clearly uh, you're bringing a lot to this that is so necessary in Black Female Project, PGS Consultants, and PreciousStroud.com. That's where you can find Precious in her terrific work. Eric, what a treat. And Precious, thank you for bringing your hope, optimism, and energy to this podcast. It was really, really a wonderful thing to listen to. Thank you again. It was great. And that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on the show. And that includes yourself. We'd like to thank 
Maggie Brown, our intrepid production coordinator. John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Communications Network, the Lumina Foundation, and the Heinz Endowments. Thank you, thank you. And check out the Heinz Endowment, their terrific podcast, We Can Be. That's hosted by Grant Oliphant, and you can find it at heinz.org slash podcast. We would certainly like to thank today's guest, and of course, all of you, and thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> no, no, thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Till next time. Let's hear it.